Hey guys, good evening. I'm so glad you're here joining us tonight. We have been doing a study of the book of Colossians for a number of weeks now, and we have made it all the way to Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. So tonight we're going to be picking up there. So thank you for joining us, and um, I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to just it. jump in, okay? Let's go. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just come before you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And God, I lift up all those that are watching tonight. God, I pray that you'll use this scripture to speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, amen. Grant, you want to kick us off? Yeah, let's jump in. Basically, what I want to do first is just give a recap of sort of where we got here, how we got here rather, which is really quick, excuse me. So what we're basically going to find is Colossians is again, like a number of these epistles that we see, they, people came in and they received Christ as their savior. And then another group of people would come in and they would try to add to the gospel. They would try to add to the gospel. They would say, well, you got, you received Christ, but now you also have to do these things. You have to go back and revert back to the law. And Paul's saying, no, 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 Jesus is enough. He took your sins, the debt that you had, and he nailed it to the cross. He nailed it to the cross of Calvary. That's what he's going to say. And so when we pick up in chapter three, Three, what I love is he's going to give some very practical advice for how to live the Christian life. Mm. I like practicality. Make it simple for me, right? And what he ends up saying is, is in verse 5 through 9, he says, I want you to get rid of some things in your life. There's some things, if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, he says, you're not supposed to do these things. If you remember, Michelle read two weeks ago, if you were raised with Christ, verse 1 of chapter 3, seek these things. He says, if you're truly a Christian, there's some things that are going to be different in your life. Mm. You don't act like the rest of the world does. And so he says, if you notice, he says in verse, uh, he picks up in verse, where's it at here? Verse two, he says, set your mind on these things. But then he says in verse five, he says that we're supposed to put to death. We're supposed to take off some things. And what does he say? He says, put off um, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, desires, covetousness. He says, there's some things we're not supposed to do anymore. If you remember in our study the last couple of weeks, I kept putting this loud jacket on. But this idea was there's some things we got to get rid of in our life. If we're going to be everything that God desires for us, there's some things we have to set aside. But then he continues in his practicality and he says in verse 12 to put on these things. He, mm -hmm. he says, don't do these things. But then he says, put on tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. Man, what a powerful verse in our age right now, in, in what's going on in our society right now. What a powerful verse. Imagine if every child of God put on tender mercy and kindness, humility, long-suffering. If we mm -hmm. if we bore with one another, we bore each other's burdens right now. Now's the time of bearing the burdens of our Christian brothers and sisters who are, who are struggling. He says, forgiving one another. And then verse 16, I think, sort of ties this whole chapter together. How are we going to do these things that God has called us to do? In our own flesh, it's we're not able to do these things. We're not able to take off and put on the things God desires, but it's by the Spirit of God that we're able to do that. And he says in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And I think this is really important as we look at verse 18 to 25 tonight, we're not going to be able to do 18 to 25 if we don't do 16. We're not going to be able to do 1 through 15 if we don't do 16. We have to allow. Remember earlier in our study, it talked about being rooted, having these deep roots in the Word of God that we're trusting in the Word of God. And he says, we have to let the Word of God dwell in us richly. We have to allow the Word of God to transform us. The transformation of your life and my life isn't going to be from what we do on the outside. That taking off and putting on is just a result of what's happened on the inside. Mm. And so that's what has to take place. And so now let's pick up in verse 18 and we'll read some of these verses together. It says in verse 18, and what he's really going to do is, maybe in some of your Bibles, you have like a little gap right there. Mine says the Christian home. Does yours mm -hmm. says that? Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's not inspired by the Word of God, right? That's been put in there. So that mm -hmm. the Christian home is not the inspired Word of God. So these verses really go together. So 16, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then it goes to 18. This is the same concept that he's mm -hmm. talking about in light of that. Yeah. He says, wives, submit, your, to submit to your own husbands as fitting unto the Lord. Now that word submit right there in the Greek translates to rank underneath. And what it really means is, is there's a responsibility, husbands and marriage, that God gives you that's different from the responsibility that God gives the wife. This is not this idea that that, that one are superior and one's inferior. I, I read in one commentary, it said it's like the vice president and the president. Both of them have a great responsibility. Both of them have great value, but there's a certain responsibility that falls on the president that's different from the responsibility that falls on the vice president. And I think in marriage, this is what he's saying, is there's a, there's a chain of command, a responsibility that God gives, and it really goes back to the garden. It's not one 
one is more important than another. And I want to tie this in because I think it's so important. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, if you remember in Genesis, um, uh, Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. And a- after the sin, they, they realize their, their nakedness. They realize that they have shame for the first time. And so then they, they hide, if you remember. And God shows up. And if you remember what God says in verse 9, Genesis 3, 9, you can write that reference down. It's going to be on our screen. The Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? That this great sin occurs in the Garden of Eden. Eve takes of the fruit. Adam takes of the fruit. And then what happens? God comes and what does he say? He doesn't say, Adam and Eve, where are you at? He says, Adam, where are you at? Mm. Adam, you're in charge of this garden. I've given it to you. Where are you at? Mm. And then what does Adam say in verse 12, Genesis 3? The man says what? The woman whom you gave me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Adam immediately tries to pass the buck. It wasn't me. It, it was this woman that you gave me. Every time I read that verse, it's probably not appropriate, but I think of that movie, The Fugitive. It wasn't me. It mm-hmm. was the one-armed man. Probably not the right thing to say. But the, in light of this verse, he says he, he immediately, I think our natural response when we're called out for something is to blame somebody else. The reason I'm doing this is because they're doing that. The reason I'm doing this is because they're doing that. But remember, we're supposed to forbear, forgive, mm-hmm. love, meekness, humility. It's not this blame game. It's what, what have I done and how can I handle what I have done? Well, God comes to Adam and he calls him out. Well, if you fast forward, and we don't have time to spend all of this in Genesis chapter 3, but I think this is just so important. If you go to verse 16, what God does is there's a punishment for the serpent, there's a punishment for man, and then there's a punishment for woman because of the sin in the garden, which they're all going to be cast out. And he says in verse 16, he says, I will greatly, this is God to Eve, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Most women will attest there's a pain involved in having children. He says, and your desire shall be for your husband and he shall have rule over you. Now, a lot of people think that punishment is unfair and why does he put women in this? But what's really happening is God's saying this, I'm not going to come back and take you blaming somebody else anymore, Adam. You're responsible now. Wife, he's responsible now. And there's a responsibility that God puts on the man. I think that is a weight, that is a good weight that God desires for us to be responsible for our families. And as a matter of fact, we're going to see in a few verses, he says, fathers don't provoke your children to wrath. He doesn't say fathers and mothers. What's he saying? He's establishing Husbands, fathers, you have a responsibility right. that's different. There's a weight that you have, and you have to handle it a certain way if you want to be blessed of the Lord. So all of this is happening as Paul's reminding us in Colossians. Paul's reminding the wife of God's order in marriage. But I love what he says. Look at the end of verse 18. As is fitting in the Lord. Mm-hmm. And that tag is so important. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. What he's saying is, is if your husband is serving the Lord in a God-honoring way, we're supposed to be wise. They're supposed to be submissive to them. Submissive yeah. to them. Not if, if your husband is abusive or controlling. It's not saying, well, the Bible says I'm supposed to submit. No, no. As is fitting in the Lord. Mm-hmm. Are they leading in a God-honoring way? Are they leading in a way that pleases the Lord? If they're not leading in that way, then not that verse, you can't take part of the verse and apply it, not the other part of the verse. Husbands, we need to be leading as a way as fitting in the Lord. Lord. Mm-hmm. You say, well, Grant, what does that mean? How are we supposed to lead in a way that's fitting into the Lord? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 19. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. Mm-hmm. So how, how, how do we lead in a way that is fitting in the Lord? Husbands, he says, love your wives. That bitter right there actually means, it translates, interestingly, to make bitter. So husbands, love your wives and do not make them bitter towards you. Don't don't make bitter. Like a lot of marriages are just are just are, 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 are defined in just bitterness and negativity and fighting mm-hmm. and strife. And, and God's saying here, no, no. Husbands, don't love your wives that way. Love them. That word love there is not romantic love. It's not like, hey, it's not not a, not a, a in, in a in a romantic type of love. That word actually is the word agape love. Mm. It is love. It is serve and sacrifice. You could say it that way. Husbands serve and sacrifice to your wives and don't be bitter towards them. Mm. It says this is how we're supposed to love. And he ties it in if you go back to parallel scripture in Ephesians chapter 5 is the example that Christ gives is as Christ loved the church and did what? Gave himself for it. Yeah. So he says, "Husbands, here's how I want you to live. I want you to live your life in such a way that you are giving yourselves to your wife. You're dying to yourself, your own selfish desires, and you're loving them. And as you're doing that, husbands, that you submit as is fitting to the Lord, that you respect, it says at the end of Ephesians chapter 5. As unto the Lord, we continually see that phrase, as unto the Lord, as unto the Lord. But he says, I want you to love in a sacrificial and in a serving way. Well, Grant, how in the world am I supposed to do that? Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. These verses are all tied together. How, how am I going to love? How is she going to submit? How are we going to do the things that God has called us to do? By letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing. Mm-hmm. Listen, if you're not doing this, you're not going to be able to do the other. Right. If you're not doing this, you're not going to be able to do the other. Let me quickly give you a couple more and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. Verse 20 says it this way. 
Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. I won't spend a lot of time on that tonight. I don't know how many kids we have up watching the Colossians Bible study tonight. Mm -hmm. Probably a small percentage of our demographic is children. But kids, if you want to please the Lord, obey your parents. Mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not pleasing the Lord if you're not obeying. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is pleasing to the Lord. God's desires, you don't want to please the Lord, obey your parents. But my mom is this or my mom is that. You might be right. But that doesn't, that doesn't release you from the responsibility of obeying mm -hmm. your parents. Um, that's what he says here. Verse 21, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. There is a lot in this verse, and I, I love this verse. And I want to focus on that word provoke. That word provoke means to irritate or embitter. Dads, listen, be patient with your kids. A piece of advice I can give to you, Dad, right now is if it's a big deal to your kids, it should be a big deal to you. Mm -hmm. If it's a big, you're like, but they just lost a toy. They're four, and they're making the biggest deal about losing this toy. Who cares? Well, you know what? To a four-year-old, losing a toy is a big deal. Right. Let me just ask you this. Is there anything that you and I can bring to the Lord that is a big deal to the Lord? Is there anything? Anything in your life or my life that's big enough that we're like, oh, what in the world am I going to do? And we take it to the Lord, and the Lord goes, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? No, no. To the Lord, there's nothing we can give him that is the biggest deal. The only makes things that make it a big deal is because he loves and cares for us. Yeah. And he says, the things that are a big deal to you, Dad, your Heavenly Father says, bring them to me. Cast mm -hmm. them upon me. He says, come and, and take on my birth. What does he say? He, he wants us to have this relationship with him where he cares about the things that we care about, not because of what we care about, because he cares about us. I mean, I think that's a good wisdom for dads. Yeah. A good wisdom to dad is if it's a big deal to your 13-year-old girl, again, it doesn't mean fall off the deep end with them and go crazy, but it means we need to show interest and value in the things that they value. Because mm -hmm. if you don't show interest and value to your 9-year-old, they're not going to tell you what they need when they're 13. Right. If you don't show interest and value to your 17-year-old because it's just annoying and they're just a 17-year-old, they're not going to come to you when they're 27. Mm -hmm. They're not. They've learned, oh, my dad doesn't care. It's not a big deal to my dad. My dad's going to say, blow it off. No, no. It needs to be a big deal to us. Right. And this is how fathers don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged. When we just blow everything off that our kids, that are a big deal to our kids, you know what it does? It discourages them. Mm. It discourages them. And yet, what does God do for you and me? He, he, he cares. Mm. And he wants us to bring these things. Fathers, we are called to encourage and equip our children. And we can't do that without verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. It all ties together. To be the husband, the wife, the father we need to be, we need to let the word of Christ dwell in us. And he continues, not just in the home, but then he's going to continue some of the things Michelle's going to talk about. Michelle, why don't you pick up verse 22? Yeah, we're going to pick up in verse 22. Let me read that to you. It says, Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Now, um, at this time, there were a lot of servants. So bond servants just means servant, but we could all, it could also mean someone who is subservient to another. Mm -hmm. So we can look at this today maybe as an employee-employer mm -hmm. relationship. And so that's kind of the context we're going to look at this in now is as an employee, we are to listen and obey those in authority over us in all things, an authority figure. It doesn't matter where you are or how high up you get, everyone has an authority right. figure in your life. Um, you know, when you're young, you always want to get out from under authority, but as you get older, you realize that's never going to happen. You're always under someone's Somebody. authority, and ultimately, we're under God's authority. That's and that's what God um, is reminding them through the Apostle Paul, that we are are to do everything not with eye service not just in front of them and then behind their back you do something else as men pleasers because that's that's focusing on men that's focusing on the human seeing not the eternal god that is seeing what is happening so not with eye service as men pleasers but in sincerity of heart, with the integrity of your heart, you're working, you're serving, you're doing what God has called you to do under the authority that God has allowed to be over your life. And you're doing that in a way that is pleasing to God. It just basically means you're truly doing a good job no matter who sees, no matter who looks, no matter who is watching. And you know, um, I know many of you, maybe you've had jobs, you start out at the bottom and you slowly, you work, you work hard and that's how 
God promotes you. Even if man doesn't promote you, God sees right. and God promotes you. I remember right. a long time ago at one of our first churches, uh, me and you were in charge of junior church. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember, remember that, that, okay? So many Sundays we never went to church because we always had junior church. Mm-hmm. And we did the best job we could possibly do. We had fun. We played with the kids. We taught Bible stories. Yeah. We taught lessons. And it's we fun. made it as fun and interesting mm-hmm. and safe as we could possibly make it for the kids. And um, that was just one of the small things we did. Another thing I remember is I remember being in charge of the nursery mm-hmm. when Daniel was the only baby in the nursery <laughs> at that point. <laughs> right. Um, right. This was many, many years ago. We went to a church. They didn't even really have an established nursery. Mm-hmm. And so we got cribs. We It was our job to redo the nursery. And so those were some of the small things that God um, just allowed us to be in charge of and kind of take charge of it. And I ran that nursery for a long time. But, but the bottom line is I was serving... Uh, you know, to the Lord. You know, many people didn't see what we do and maybe you're in the same position. Many Mm -hmm. people don't see what you do behind the scenes. They don't see the hard work that you put in, but we are to put it in as unto the Lord. But in sincerity of heart, fearing God, it's saying, you know what? I know that God is my ultimate authority in this situation Mm -hmm. and I'm going to work as if I'm really working for him because I really am. All right, and then that's going to tie into verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, not to men. Whatever you do, whatever your task Mm -hmm. is. And, um, you know, that can be either doing things at home, like Grant was talking about, doing things with your own children, Mm -hmm. whatever you do, whether you're working on the job, whether you're having fun, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Give it, do it heartily just means give it everything you've got. No matter what we do, give it everything we've got and do it to the, um, do it to uh, please God. Mm Mm-hmm. Put in your very best effort. Put in your very best effort uh, in whatever task that you are doing. Do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Mm. The ultimate rewarder in anything we do on this earth, whether it's parenting, whether it's working at a job, whether it's um, in our marriages, whether it's our relationship with our kids, our relationship with our boss at work, our relationship with those underneath uh, our authority. Maybe you're watching and you are high up in your company. Maybe you have uh, people authority over you, but uh, you are, have authority, people under your authority. Mm-hmm. Whatever you're doing, how you treat them, God sees that. Right. And God knows what is happening. And so here he's reminding us that um, from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Now I circled the word inheritance. Now why is he talking about inheritance here mm-hmm. it's because you're if you're a christian you're a son or a daughter of the king god is going to give you an inheritance god is going to ultimately reward you for whatever mm-hmm. you are doing as the smallest task to the greatest task mm-hmm. we have someone that is watching constantly right. And that he is going to be the rewarder. And I love that because I think that's an encouragement. Many times we do things and we think nobody sees, nobody cares. Maybe you've, uh, during this time, maybe you've reached out and you've done something special for someone just to encourage them, just to help them. God is the one that sees and rewards. Even if that is never mentioned, even if it's never acknowledged, Mm -hmm. even if a thank you note is never written, God is the one that is going to give you that reward of the inheritance. For you, look at verse 25, uh, or the end of verse 24. For you serve the Lord Christ. Mm -hmm. You serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, actually, you don't just work for them. You don't just serve them. You're not just under their authority. You're actually under the Lord's authority. You know, a big phrase that has just been meaningful to me the last couple of years is, Jesus is Lord. Over every situation, even over this, Jesus is Lord. And just submitting that to him and telling God, God, I just, I'm confessing right now, Jesus is Lord, even over this situation. When I think everything is spinning out of control, when I think that um, I don't know what's going to happen, I just confess, Jesus, you are Lord, even over this. And so he's reminding them that they actually serve the Lord Jesus Mm -hmm. Christ, okay? Verse 25, but he who does wrong will be repaid. Now I underlined, will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Now, God is reminding us 
that he is a God of justice. Mm -hmm. And in this time, we need to know that, that God is a God of justice. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. You know, God says he's not going to give any special treatment. He sees everything, mm -hmm. and he knows what is wrong, what is done that is wrong. He sees evil that is done. He sees injustice, and he is the one that ultimately is going to repay mm -hmm. people that do that, whether it be here on the earth or whether it be one day in heaven. God is God is going to make sure that righteousness is um, is done. He right. is the righteous Good. judge. And uh, that word justice, God is the God of justice. Justice just means right or as it should be. It's good. In being made in the image of God, we long for moral justice to be done mm -hmm. in our society. When we see something done that's wrong, we we long for it to be made right. Yeah. That's because we're made in the image of God. Yeah. And that is inside of us that rises up and says, this is not right. Mm -hmm. And so God is reminding us here, listen, you serve the Lord. You work on your marriage. You, um, you do good to your children. Mm -hmm. uh, you honor your employers and employees. And you do what you're supposed to do to those that are over your authority. And if anyone mistreats you or anyone does something wrong to you, then guess what? I'm the one that's going to repay them. I'm the mm -hmm. one that's watching. Yeah. I'm the one that's going to make sure that anyone that does something wrong is, is going to be handled. And God is going to see to it. So yeah. don't ever think that someone gets away with something. Mm -hmm. When someone mistreats you or does something wrong... God is watching, and mm -hmm. He is going to uh, He is going to discipline that person. Mm -hmm. He is going to make sure that justice is served in His Good. terms and in His time. Mm -hmm. Not always our timing, but in His terms and His time. And I just want to encourage you that the theme, really the theme of all these eight verses, verses eighteen through twenty-five, the theme is as to the Lord. No so matter good. what we do, we say, Jesus is Lord. No matter what position that we're in, if we're a wife, we're submitting to our husband as to the Lord. If we're a child, we're obeying our parent as to the Lord. If we're an employee working for an employer, we're, we're working for them like we're working for the Lord because the Lord has given us that job. No matter what we are doing, uh, we are doing it uh, unto the Lord. And we are declaring Jesus is Lord and that Jesus is the center of our lives. And we're saying, you know what, as a wife, as a child, as a, as a father, as a mother, as an employee, I'm going to say Jesus is the center of my life mm -hmm. and I'm going to serve as if he is the, at the That's center good. and the Lord of my life. So I love these scriptures. And um, you know what? They they give us perspective and they give us an order of how things are supposed to mm -hmm. go. And we need that. Yeah. We need to know what God expects of us. And we need to know the order that God has placed over mm -hmm. our life so that there's not confusion. Mm -hmm. So really good scriptures. Yeah. Grant, you want to close no, us out? I, I love that. And you continually saying that as to the Lord, you go through these from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Serving the Lord, that phrase, Lord, Lord, well pleasing to the Lord, fitting to the Lord. I mean, it, there's this surrounding of everything, as Michelle said, that it all comes back to the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, that question, you know, we have as we even close these times out together is, is do you know the Lord? Mm -hmm. Has there been that moment in your life where you have submitted that you've said that phrase that Michelle said, Jesus is mm -hmm. Lord? Jesus is Lord. That means he is supreme. He is He is overall. It is about him, for him. We read that earlier in Colossians. It all is about Jesus. He is the Lord. And has there been that moment in your life where you have submitted and gave your heart and your life to the Lord? You know, the scripture says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one's perfect. We're not perfect. You're not perfect. No one is perfect. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Because of sin in your life and because of sin in my life, it's going to happen. And it says at the end there, he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. There's going to come a time where we have to give an account for our sin. Mm -hmm. And that account for our sin when we stand before the Lord is a separation from him unless someone pays the penalty. Mm -hmm. And what Colossians says is Jesus paid for your sins and for my sins on the cross of Calvary. Mm -hmm. He paid for your sins and for my sins. And we can have forgiveness of our sins if we put our faith and our trust in him. The most famous verse in all the Bible is John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world, he loved everybody in the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know the Lord? Mm -hmm. Have you put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? You're not going to be able to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly if you don't have a relationship with the Lord. And that relationship comes through Jesus Christ, 
through confessing your sins, asking him to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and surrendering that Jesus is Lord. You can't do it on your own. You were never meant to do it on your own, but Jesus is Lord. If you're listening to this tonight and you've never put your faith and trust in him, I want to encourage you right where you are right where you're seated tonight. Maybe you're watching this in the middle of June 2020, or maybe you're watching this five years from now. Wherever you are, if you've not put your faith and trust in the Lord, and you'd like to do that right now, I'm going to lead you through something we call the sinner's prayer. And this is me just giving you the words to confess your sins to God, to surrender to him and ask for the forgiveness of your sins. And scripture says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right where you are, let's pray together. Mm -hmm. Let us pray right now. Let's pray. If you want to know Jesus as your Savior, pray this prayer right where you are. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you. Right where you are, pray to the Lord. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you. I believe you died in my place and I want to receive you right now as my Savior. In the quietness of your heart, call upon the Lord. Jesus, I'm sorry for all my sins. Please forgive me. I believe that you alone are the Lord and I surrender all of me to you right now. Right where you are, would you just pray that prayer? Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. I believe that you alone are the Lord, and I surrender all of me to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you said that prayer and put your faith and your trust in Christ, it is the best decision you could ever make in your life. And we want to rejoice and celebrate with you. Please reach out to us, our website, mid-way.com. There's a Uh, some information on there about how to know Jesus and what to do if you've put your faith and trust in him. And we just want to encourage you. But you know, maybe you're listening to this right now and you're struggling as a husband or maybe as a wife. Maybe you're struggling as as a parent right now. Listen, you can do this. You can do this, but not alone. You can do it with the Lord's help. Seek his face. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Admonish, encourage yourself with psalms and hymns, spiritual psalms. And reach out and get help if you need it. We're praying for God's best for your life. We're praying that you live your life as unto the Lord. And if you do that, he will reward because he sees all. We love you. We're excited about our time together with you. And we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.